Welcome back students to our Chemistry 2620 video notes. In this video we're going to look at chapter 27, my favorite, polymers. So polymers are molecules that are everywhere and we're just really not aware uh, of what they are and where they're used. So let's start by talking about what a polymer is. So the word polymer has two parts to it. It has the poly and the mer. So the poly part means many, and the mer means unit. And so what we're seeing here is many small molecules that are now going to be bound together to make one super huge molecule. There are two types of polymerization. There are uh, condensation polymerizations. And then there is something called addition polymerization. In addition polymerization, there are subclasses of radical polymerization, cationic, and anionic. Condensation polymerizations are a type called step growth. And these are similar to reactions we've previously seen, like Fischer esterification. So let's look at some components of polymers, and then we'll look at the reactions to make polymers. So because polymers are very big, what we do is we draw something called a repeat unit. And even here, as I've drawn my big polymer, I have these squiggly lines over here that mean that this unit continues, or this polymer chain continues to grow in either direction. When we talk about big, we're not talking 300 grams per mole. We're talking 3,000, 5,000, 7, 10,000 grams per mole for a molecular weight. These are big. So what we usually do when we're trying to communicate a polymer to somebody else is we draw something called a repeat unit. This is what your repeat unit looks like. Notice how in your repeat unit, you have one carbon here, one carbon here, and then a chlorine here. If we look at this longer chain of the polymer, the smallest piece that we could pull out that would continue the pattern would be these three atoms. And so it's just these three atoms over and over again that are bound to one another. And so this bond is the one that's linking the repeat units together. So you're going to see repeat units written where the smallest portion that we can repeat to create the polymer chain is written with brackets and the the parts of the carbon that extend past the brackets are meant to say that this thing happens over and over again and then the n that's right here is just saying that this repeat unit can happen a whole bunch of number of times if there's a particular number there, then that means that, that polymer has that many repeat units. If it's N, then it's general. So let's talk about names of polymers. When we name a polymer, the pattern is usually poly followed by the name of the monomer. Well, if polymer is many units, monomer is one unit. So the monomer is the small molecule that the polymer reaction starts off uh, with. So we're going to see monomers on the next page. So give me a moment. We'll just name a couple right here. If we started off with uh, ethylene, then we would make polyethylene. <laughs> 
if we started off with vinyl chloride, we would make poly vinyl chloride. If we started off with styrene, then what uh, polymer is, is called polystyrene. S-T-Y-R-E-N-E. So I drew out some common polymers here down below for you. Oops. In these um, very common polymers, these are ones that um, you see every day and don't realize. So this first one is polyvinyl chloride, which we abbreviate as PVC, which hopefully you recognize as the same PVC that's used in plumbing. Um, PVC is also recycling number five. If you've ever looked on the bottom of plastic packaging and you see a five, um, that is polyvinyl chloride. This next one is polystyrene, which is abbreviated PS. Polystyrene can come in polystyrene foam, and it can also come in sheets. The sheets are rather brittle, so you don't see them a lot of times in plastic packaging, but if you do, they are number six. Polypropylene is uh, this one. Um, and now that I'm thinking about it, polypropylene might be number four. Five and PVC might be number three. I'm gonna have to pause and look that up. All right, I paused and I looked it up and uh, I was incorrect the first time. PVC is number three and polypropylene is number five. Uh, this one here is called polyethylene. There are actually two types of polyethylene. There's something called low-density polyethylene and something called high-density polyethylene. So depending upon how many accidental branches there are in the molecule, depends upon if you have recycling number uh, one or four. And I say accidental branches because polyethylene has this repeat unit and that's your goal. If these, uh, if this doesn't branch and it just creates a super long chain that looks like this, then those can stack really nicely and you can fit a lot of them into a small amount of space and that makes high density polyethylene. But the problem is, is the type of polymerization that goes on is really prone to branching, meaning that sometimes you'll get very long branches um, not just two carbons, but even more than that. And then it's like you have all of these, well, branches or sticks coming off of that main chain, and then it makes them a lot harder to pack. And imagine that um, you're talking about like trees or something. You know, if you ever see people moving logs, the logs never have any branches on them because you can fit more logs in a trunk if there's no branches on them. If you leave all the darn branches on, you're gonna be able to fit a lot less logs in there. And the same thing is true with polyethylene and high density polyethylene versus low density polyethylene. So then another one that you're used to seeing is called Teflon. People are kind of freaked out about Teflon uh, at this particular moment because they're worried about how it scrapes off of pots uh, in the nonstick pots and whatnot and then um, goes into your body. And the problem is, is it's so non-reactive that it never leaves. So it bioaccumulates and they don't know really uh, if that has a negative effect on people or not. And so whenever something bioaccumulates, people get a little bit nervous. And then this one is a nylon compound, and uh, nylon is a type of polyamid. Notice how here you have your amid group. Uh, nylons are special in their nomenclature because what happens in nylon is a lot of times you have two numbers following the nylon, and this one is nylon 6-6. Six, six. So the first number in nylon 6-6, six, six, so that first 6, is illustrating the number of carbons there are between the amines, whereas the second six is illustrating the number of carbons there are in the diacid portion, including the carbons of the carbonyl. So you have four carbons between them, and then you have one carbon of this carbonyl, one carbon of this carbonyl, and so that's where you're getting that second six from. So in nylon nomenclature, the pattern is always the first uh, numerical value comes from the uh, number of carbons between the uh, two nitrogens, and then the second uh, number is 
the number of carbons between the two carbonyls plus the carbonyl carbons. So nylon actually has a super fascinating history, so I'll just give you a really brief um, discussion of it. So nylon was discovered in the 1930s by this brilliant scientist named Wallace Carruthers. And before Wallace Carruthers could really see how useful his discovery was, he had these terrible bouts of depression. And so he actually didn't think that he had done anything significant in his career. I think he was about, he was in his 30s as well around that time. And he ended up committing suicide. And then only later did, you know, people really understand how big his idea was that you can take compounds that are small molecules and make a bigger molecule. And nylon ended up being first used as the bristles of nylon toothbrushes, then uh, ladies' stockings, and then in 1940s, early 1940s, almost all nylon production went to parachutes and uh, nylon ropes for uh, World War II. So nylon's pretty fascinating. Um, we could talk a lot more about it, but I probably mean the only one who thinks it's fascinating. So let's talk about polymerization instead. So let's first talk about addition polymerizations. So in this type of addition polymerization, this is a radical polymerization, right? So this is your most common addition polymerization. Radical polymerization happens first with a process called initiation. Initiation is when you take a compound that is Call, it's called thermally liable, which means that this bond right here is really easily broken by light or heat. So when light or heat hits this bond, you get these fish hook arrows where you have two radicals form. Remember, the fish hook arrows are the movement of a single electron instead of a movement of a pair of electrons. Once those radicals are formed, they encounter your monomer. And when they encounter your monomer, they do uh, this type of reaction where the pi bond breaks and one of the electrons goes on to uh, this carbon right here and the other electron goes to the creation of a bond between here and here. So one of the problems with radical um, mechanisms is students really struggle with some of those mechanisms because we're pointing to what looks like thin air over here and what we're doing is we're saying that we're forming a new sigma bond which we're not used to doing so this new sigma bond is here all right, and these arrows pointed to that general space. So once you have this radical, that radical then propagates. So it continues to react with more monomers. So let's show some propagation steps. So for propagation, the same type of thing is going to happen. You're going to be forming a bond between the radical and the carbon right here. And so this bond is going to break. One of the electrons is going to form that bond. This, oops, that's probably too close together. Let's try that. And this radical electron is going to be one that forms the bond. And then we're propagating because we're continually making a radical. So one of the things you might notice is that it looks like the initiation step includes a propagation step. And that's kind of true. Um, the initiation step is always two parts. First, the creation of the radical and the first propagation step. So once you have this, then the radical finds yet another monomer. And remember, we're forming a bond between this radical and that carbon. So this radical reacts to form a pi or a sigma bond here, and then that pi bond breaks. One of the electrons will go to reform the radical. So we just continue this process, and this process happens over and over. Oh, that's ugly. And over again until there's no more monomer left. 
And so it just continues to happen. So then let's talk about what occurs at the end of this process. At the end of this process, you get termination. Termination can happen two ways. The less likely way for termination to happen uh, is that your initial radical, which for some reason maybe is still hanging out, it probably reacted. Um, this one will react to end that chain. So termination is called termination because we stop the reaction. Then the other mode of termination is when the ends of two polymer chains find each other and they react. That's a weird looking arrow. Let's try that again. That looks nicer. And remember where we're forming a bond is between these two, just like how we formed a bond between those two, right? This is the bond that we formed. So the thing is that when we form this bond between the two polymer chains, what ends up happening is, I'm gonna draw that a different way, is that we get kind of this weird middle point. I'm gonna show you that in a moment when we're done drawing. All right, so most students just wanna continue this pattern, but the problem is you just connected your two chains like this. So this bond right here, oh, I was trying to circle that in yellow. This bond right here is the bond that we formed. The issue is this bond is easy to break. And what will happen is that bond will break first if the polymer gets too hot. And so that's why when we're working on recycling, what ends up happening is the polymer actually breaks down during that recycling process. Because in order to get your polymer up to a temperature where it needs to be, where, where the polymer needs to be in order to be reformed into a new product, that temperature happens to be very close to the temperature where this bond breaks. And then you start to see polymer degradation, and that's a problem um, because as your polymer degrades, it loses its properties, and then it's not any good to you any longer. And so that's why um, recycling is actually a lot harder than people think it is. So then our last type of addition polymerization before we move into uh, step growth or condensation polymerization is anionic and cationic. So let's look at an example of anionic polymerization. In this anionic polymerization, the pi bond reacts with the butyl lithium to create a carbanion. So remember your butyl lithium we talked about in an earlier chapter is kind of like it is a, um, oh, what's the word? Ah, a carbanion. And so this is going to attack your pi bond and then these electrons will swing around here and they will create a uh, carbanion. And so the butyl of the butyl lithium will be attached here at this position. And then we will have an R group here and our carbanion will live on this carbon. And then what will happen is another monomer will get attacked. And so the pair of electrons will swing around and it will attack the pi bond and the electrons will go onto that secondary carbon and continue to create a carbanion. Pay special attention to which carbon is being attacked here and keep in mind that the most stable carbanion must form. So that means that we should stop and ask ourselves which one's more stable, a primary carbanion or secondary carbanion? And I think you know the answer to that. In the next example, which is cationic polymerization, 
your pi bond of the monomer ends up acting in an acid-base type fashion and being protonated. When that pi bond acts in this way, what we end up with now is a cation. So again, here you need to ask yourself, what's the most stable cation that'll form? Because your options are primary and secondary, so you should have the secondary one be forming. That secondary carbocation is going to then be attacked by the another monomer and this is how we start to form the chain in our cationic polymerization and of course both of these just continue to happen over and over and over again until you get to that termination step at the end so some really common questions associated with polymerization is things like which of these would be most reactive toward anionic, anionic polymerization. This question, reworded, is really which is the strongest electron withdrawing group? Because what happens during cationic, I'm sorry, anionic polymerization is you get an anion here and then you have an R group up here. Well, that anion is only stabilized if the R group is electron withdrawing. If the R group pulls electron density this direction, then it helps stabilize that excess electron density. So remember that your electron withdrawing group will best stabilize the carbanion by removing electron density. Oh, that's awful. Let's try that again. So then looking at what is going to be most reactive toward cationic polymerization is kind of the opposite. Oops. So for cationic polymerization, this is really another way to say which is the strongest electron donating group. Because in cationic polymerization, you're creating a carbocation during this process. And so in order to stabilize the carbocation, we need a group that's going to donate electron density. So we need an electron donating group that is strong because it will best stabilize the carbocation by giving it extra electron density. So in this case, you need a group that's going to push electron density in. So now that we know what these questions are really asking, let's answer them. So if we want to look at which group is going to be best toward anionic polymerization, we need to look at the groups that are attached here, here, and here. And we need to remember from an earlier chapter which one is the strongest electron withdrawing group. And that one should be nice and easy, the nitro group. It wins for sure. Uh, the next question, which would be most reactive toward cationic polymerization, well, we need to do a similar thing here, where we look at this group, this group, and this group, and decide which one is the best electron donating group. And that would be the one with the lone pairs adjacent to the pi bond. And just pay 
close attention to um, these types of questions because it might ask you, instead of just circling the one or telling which one is most reactive, it might ask you to rank them. And so it is important to know which one, say, is a, uh, a weak electron donating group versus a strong electron donating group so that you'd be able to rank. So we've got one more type of polymerization to talk about. Our last type of polymerization is called step growth polymerization, which is a class of condensation polymers. So during the condensation polymerization, what ends up happening is reactions that we already know exist. This was actually one of the ways that Wallace Carruthers convinced people that polymers were small molecules that had a physical bond between them. Because before Wallace Carruthers and Hermann Staudinger came up with that uh, idea, people thought that polymers were just um, aggregates of molecules. So like a bunch of molecules just hanging out next to one another. They didn't think they were actually bound together. And so one of the things, um, one of the ways or the logic that um, early chemists in the 1930s were able to convince other chemists that polymers were bound together is they said things like, hey, see this carboxylic acid group? That reacts with this, right? When we have an acid catalyst, that's just Fischer esterification. And they were like, oh, uh, yeah. And so they said, okay, well, let's draw that. So we know that these two things react with one another. So we draw our Fischer sterification product like this. And then what happened was people like Wallace Carruthers and Herman Staudinger said, hey, see this? That's still reactive, right? If that it came into um, contact with a diacid, this is a diacid, it would react and people would say, um, yes, of course. And then they would say, well, what about over here? Isn't this also reactive toward a dialcohol? And they would say, well, of course. And so then the logic started to come of people saying, wait a moment. If this molecule is what's called difunctional, then it can react on both sides, like how we see here and here, that can react on both sides. Here and here, these can react on both sides. So once your difunctional molecule has reacted in these parts that I've highlighted yellow, there's still another functional group that can grow the molecule this way, and this functional group can grow the molecule this way. So that's why it's called step growth, because step by step, reaction by reaction, the molecule gets a little bit bigger. So let's pretend that we took this and we added, oh, I don't know, more ethylene glycol. Right, the ethylene glycol is this one. So if you add more ethylene glycol, then what you'll find is that one of your OHs will happily react with this carboxylic acid. And so we start to extend that side of the molecule. And now we have OHs here and here. So if we added two molecules of diacid, then in the next step, we could add or extend our polymer even longer. So we could add a molecule on this side and we could add a molecule on this side. And so if we keep on adding and we keep on adding, we end up with something called a, a polymer. And that polymer's repeat unit looks like this. This polymer is called polyethylene terephthalate it's P-E-T-E, -E, recycling number one. It is the best polymer for recycling because you can hydrolyze those bonds and turn that ester in back into the diacid and the dialcohol and then just repeat that process again because you can't do that with other polymers. Other polymers don't work that way. They're like the other example that we saw when you start to heat it up, it just degrades. So 
if you're looking to reduce your amount of waste on the planet, you're going to look for things that are packaged in polyethylene terephthalate because they actually recycle well. It's called a high-value plastic. Recycling number five, polypropylene, is also a high-value plastic. Everything else is crap. So that's it for our polymer chapter. As always, thank you for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.